And then lastly, in terms of currency risk, we need to look at a currency swap. And with a currency swap, we are just going to have two different companies in two different countries swapping currencies between them. However, it's important to note that the original obligation that they have with the bank does not change. And then in addition to that, please note currency swaps are traded over the counter. So it's not on a formalized exchange, it's over the counter, which means it can be customized to meet the company's exact requirements. Let's look at the example below. In this example, we have Jacobs Limited, and Jacobs is a South African company, and they have identified an investment opportunity in the UK, which is going to cost the company 10 million pounds. Jacobs can borrow locally in South Africa at 9% per annum in RAND terms, or they can borrow in the UK at 3% plus a 2% premium as the company is foreign. Then we also have Millennium Incorporated, and this is a UK company, and they want to invest 224.2 million rand in South Africa. They can borrow at 3% per annum in pound terms in the UK, or they can borrow at 9% plus 2% in RAND terms in South Africa. Now what we need to do first is determine whether each of these companies should borrow in their home country or should they rather borrow in the country that they want to invest in. So for example, if we look at Jacobs, Jacobs is a South African company. Should they rather borrow the money in South Africa and then convert that money into pounds so that they can invest in the UK? Or should they rather just borrow in the UK? Because if they borrow in the UK, they will already have the amount in foreign currency, so they won't have to convert it into foreign currency. They will then have the money available in the currency that they need it in order to make the investment that they want in the UK. So what should each company do? Should they borrow locally in their home country or should they borrow in the country that they are trying to invest in? So what we are doing first is determining what is going to be cheaper from an interest perspective. So we are looking at the different interest rates in the different countries and determining what is going to be best in terms of the interest rates that they can get. So please note, we know if Jacobs borrows in South Africa, they can borrow at a rate of 9% per annum. And if Millennium borrows in the UK, they can borrow at a rate of 3% per annum. So that gives us a combined cost of 12%. So that is the combined interest cost if both companies borrow in their home country. What happens if both companies borrow in the country that they are trying to invest in? So in other words, Jacobs is trying to invest in the UK. If they borrow in the UK, they are going to pay interest at a rate of 3 plus 2%. So if they borrow in the UK, they are going to pay interest at a rate of 5%. Millennium is looking at investing in South Africa. If they borrow in South Africa, they are going to pay interest at a rate of 9% plus a premium of 2%. So if they borrow in South Africa, they end up paying interest at a rate of 11%. So combined, we get a total interest cost of 16%. So by performing this calculation, we can see it is cheaper for both companies to rather borrow in their home country instead of the country where they are looking at investing. So you can see just below, overall it is cheaper for Jacobs to borrow in South Africa and for Millennium to borrow in the UK. 
This results in a combined saving of 4%, so the difference between these two rates. And it also makes sense that each company borrows funds in the country where they are known to the market. Because we saw when we performed the calculation above, when you borrow in a foreign country, you end up paying a premium. If Jacobs wanted to borrow in the UK, they pay a premium of 2%. And if Millennium wants to borrow in South Africa, they also pay a premium of 2%. So it's therefore better for both companies to rather borrow in their home country. Now the problem with this is if Jacobs borrows in South Africa, they are going to get RANDs. And they don't want RANDs. They are looking at investing in the UK and the investment is going to cost them 10 million pounds. So they need pounds. Similarly, Millennium, if they go and borrow in the UK, they are going to get pounds, but they don't want pounds. They are looking at investing in South Africa and they need rands for that investment. So this is where the currency swap is going to come in. However, before we look at the swap, I said to you that the original obligation to their respective bank does not change. So let's first just look at the obligation to their bank. Once we are happy with the obligation that they have to their bank, we can then look at how the currency swap is going to work. So first, let's just look at Jacobs. And then we will look at Millennium. Now, for this currency swap to work, each of these companies needs to borrow what the other company needs. So, in other words, Jacobs is going to go to their bank and they are going to borrow what Millennium needs. What does Millennium need? Millennium needs 224.2 million rand. So Jacobs is going to go and borrow that from their bank. You borrow what the other company needs. And in addition to that, Millennium is then going to go to their bank in the UK and they are going to borrow what Jacobs needs. Jacobs needs 10 million pounds. So that's what Millennium will borrow from their bank. So those are the obligations that each company has to their respective banks. So Jacobs is going to owe their bank 224.2 million. They are going to loan what Millennium needs and Millennium is going to go to their bank in the UK and borrow what Jacobs needs. So they are then going to owe their bank 10 million pounds. So what are the interest obligations in terms of these loans? Annually, Jacobs is going to pay interest at a rate of 9% per annum and Millennium is going to pay interest at a rate of 3% per annum because both of them are borrowing in the home country. So if we work out the annual interest payment, this gives me 20,178,000 and Millennium pays interest at a rate of 3% to their bank so that's an annual interest payment of 300,000 pounds. So look at what happens. Jacob goes to their bank in South Africa in their home country and they loan what Millennium needs. Millennium goes to their bank in the UK and they borrow what Jacob's needs. So each company borrows in their home country and they borrow what the other company needs and then they swap this money between the two of them so you can see that just above Jacobs is going to give Millennium the 224.2 million Rand 
and Millennium is going to give Jacobs the 10 million pounds. So they swap between the two of them. So now both companies have what they need for investment purposes. Jacobs needed 10 million pounds so that they can invest in the UK. They've received that money from Millennium so they can make the investment. Millennium needs 224.2 million rand so that they can invest in South Africa. So they go to their banks, they borrow what the other company needs, and then they swap the money between themselves. And then just below, you can see I've calculated the effective exchange rate on this swap. So that's effectively the exchange rate that they are using when they swap this money between the two of them. We then need to look at what happens each year when the companies need to pay interest on these loans. So we have already performed the calculation above in terms of their obligations to the bank. Every year for the next five years, Jacobs is going to have to pay interest of 20 million 178 to their bank, and Millennium is going to have to pay interest of 300,000 pounds to their bank. So the respective obligations with their banks do not change. So you can see that in the diagram below. Every year, Millennium is going to pay interest of £300,000 to their bank in the UK. And Jacobs is going to pay interest of £20.178 million to their bank in South Africa. The obligation to the bank does not change. Then, we need to look at what the arrangement is in terms of the swap agreement. If we look above, in terms of the swap agreement, both companies have agreed to the following. Jacobs is going to pay interest at a rate of 3% to Millennium. And Millennium is going to pay interest at a rate of 9% to Jacobs. So if we look at this on the diagram below, we see Jacobs is going to pay interest at 3% to Millennium. So Jacobs is going to pay interest of 300000 pounds to Millennium, and we said Millennium is going to pay Jacobs interest at 9%. So Millennium is going to pay interest of 20,178,000 to Jacobs. That is at a rate of 9%. So that is what they are going to swap between the two of them in addition to their original obligations that they have with their bank. Now, I want you to assume that at the end of year one, the spot rate is 22 rand 62 is one pound. So look at what happens. Jacobs is going to pay interest at a rate of 3%. So Jacobs is going to pay interest of 300,000 pounds to Millennium. Now be careful, Jacobs is a South African company. So if Jacobs wants to pay this money across to Millennium, they are going to have to take South African rands to their bank, convert those rands into pounds so that they can then pay millennia. So if this is the exchange rate, they are going to have to take 6,786,000 rand to their bank. If they take those rands to their bank, using that exchange rate, the bank will then give them 300,000 pounds. So they'll then have the pounds that they need in order to pay Millennium. However, please note, Millennium is also going to have to pay Jacobs. So Millennium is going to have to go to their bank in the UK, and they are going to have to exchange their pounds, because they are a British company, they are going to have to exchange their pounds into rands, so that they can get this rand amount that they need to pay to Jacobs. So the rand amount that Millennium owes Jacobs is 20,178,000. Now I want you to think about this logically. Let's look at a basic example. Take this away from management accounting so that you understand the logic behind what I'm doing. Let's say, for example, I owe you 20 rand but you owe me 
five rand. So think about this logically. I'm not going to give you the 20 rand and you give me the five rand. The net effect is I owe you 15 rand. So we are applying exactly the same logic over here. Jacobs owes Millennium 6,786,000. However, Millennium owes Jacobs 20,178,000. So they're not going to both go to their banks and exchange their home currency for foreign currency so that they can pay the other company. Instead, they are just going to look at the net amount. And the net amount is Millennium owes Jacobs 13,392,000. So actually, Jacobs doesn't have to go to their bank at all and exchange any money in order to get pounds to give Millennium. Jacobs is not going to pay Millennium anything because the net effect is that Millennium actually owes Jacobs. Now, the benefit of this, guys, you can see just below. Jacobs is saved from having to purchase any foreign currency. They don't have to get any foreign currency in order to pay Millennium because the net effect is Millennium only owes Jacobs. And if we look at this from Millennium's perspective, the amount that they need to convert into foreign currency is also reduced. So it also reduces the transaction cost from their side because Millennium is not going to go to their bank and buy 20,178,000 Rand. They are only going to go to their bank for the net amount. So they are converting less pounds into Rands. So this results in savings for both companies. So guys, this is going to happen every single year. Every year, the companies will pay their respective banks what they owe them. And then in addition to that, instead of Jacobs paying Millennium and Millennium paying Jacobs, they will calculate what the net amount is and they will only transfer across the net amount. And then right at the end of the loan period, so at the end of five years time, all they do is they swap the money back between the two of them. So Jacobs is then going to give the 10 million pounds back to Millennium and Millennium is going to give the 224.2 million Rand back to Jacobs. They swap the money back and then each of the parties use that money in order to pay back the banks what they owe them. So we can look at this currency swap in three different stages. First, when they enter into the loan agreement, they go to their banks and they borrow what the other company needs and then they swap the money between themselves. So that happens upfront at the beginning of the period. Then every year, both of the companies are obviously going to pay their banks what they owe them. And then between the two of them, they will calculate the net amount of interest that is owed between the two of them. And they will only transfer the net amount across. And then right at the end of the loan period, they will swap the money back. And they will then use that money in order to settle their original obligations with their banks. And the whole reason why we've performed this currency swap is this has had the effect of minimizing borrowing costs because we saw by both of them borrowing in their home countries, interest rates were reduced. So we've minimized borrowing costs. And in addition to that, we've also hedged currency exposure. Every year, Jacobs doesn't have to pay any interest across to Millennium, so they're not exposed to any currency risk on interest payments. And the net amount that Millennium has to pay across to Jacobs is less than the total amount, so their currency risk is also reduced. <laughs> 